All right, thanks for the introduction, Barry. Um, yeah, I'm glad to be here. I've known Barry for quite a while. Um, quick show of hands. Uh, how many people here are, say, would say you're very familiar with Austrian economics and Rothbard, that kind of thinking? Okay, so I'm going to exp- I'm going to withdraw. All right, how many people are familiar with Ayn Rand? <laughs> well, I'm not going to draw on Ayn Rand, so that doesn't help. So. <laughs> I'm going to draw mostly on Austrian economics and uh, a Rothbardian type property thinking. So what I'll do is I'll try to explain as I go along. If I'm too patronizing, stop me. <laughs> if, if I say something that is, uh, uh, what I'll do is I'll probably talk for 20 or 30 minutes. And if we want to have Q&A, we can do that. But I don't mind if anyone, we have a small group here, if anyone wants to interrupt me in the middle, if I use some term that is going over people's heads and I'm assuming too much, feel free to just interrupt me because uh, I don't mind at all. Um, uh, I don't have a handout, but I just have notes. If anyone wants these notes later, uh, I'll be happy to email them to you. Okay, so my topic is probably a little less practical, and uh, it's a little more abstract than you usually would hear, I assume, from the talks Barry has told me that you normally have. But it's on property, which is suitable for the Houston Property Rights Association. Okay, So I am an attorney. I'm a patent attorney, intellectual property attorney. I've done it for over 20, 24 years now. Um, and I am also a uh, Rothbardian, uh, uh, what you might call an anarchist libertarian, Austrian economics influenced. I have been for over 20 years as well. So that's my background, that's my theory, that's where I come from. Uh, I have a feeling most people here will disagree with, with what I'm going to say in the end, but I want to talk about intellectual property, but to do that we need to talk about property because I find this whole area is very confusing to most people. They don't really understand it. Uh, the arguments are all over the map, people are confused, and the only way to get a clear understanding of how we should think about IP, which we call intellectual property, is to understand property itself, right? Uh, and then we can figure out where IP, what IP is, and how it should fit into the legal system of, our, of a free society, or whether it should at all, okay? So I'm going to start out with a quote. It's maybe a little bit of an inside joke, but uh, a, a great Austrian thinker. Now, the Austrians, you know, there was a lot of intellects that came from Austria in the 1920s or so, uh, tons of influential uh, philosophers and thinkers, and a lot of the Austrian school of economics came from there too. Mises, Hayek, von Bauer, Karl Menger, uh, Wieser, these guys. So, there's a, and then the modern Austrian school is Rothbard and uh, other thinkers like that who draw upon uh, the, the works of the Austrians. So, there was a great Austrian thinker who was asked, what is best in life? And his answer was, to crush your enemies, to see them driven before you, and to hear the lamentations of their women. Now, it's a little bit of a joke because that's, that's Conan the Barbarian, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, an Austrian, but not really an Austrian economist. But, <laughs> but the relevance of this is that there, there is a, a, a grain of wisdom in there, right? That, qu- that quote, the answer by Conan, recognizes conflict in life. Right, you have these people that want to win their battle. They they want to they want to win. But why do they have a battle? They have a battle because in this world that we live in, there are scarce resources. If we didn't live in a world like this, there would be no such thing as battles, no such thing as violence, clashing, or conflicts. The reason we have battles and conflicts like that is because there's only so much of certain things in the world to go around, and people fight over those things because they both want to control these things. Right? So this is the background of, of why there's such a thing as conflict, why there's fighting, why there's violence. There couldn't be violence without the material world around us and without things that we use in our daily lives and that, we, uh, that only one person can use at a time. And so then you have the possibility of conflict or disagreement over that. Okay? So we don't live in a world of what economists call superabundance. Superabundance means everything is so plentiful it's like the Garden of Eden, and we're basically all magical beings that can conjure up things in the blink of an eye. And there can be no possibility of theft or violence or clashing. That's not the world we live in, right? We live in a world where conflict is possible, so you have to keep that in mind, okay? So another way to put it is we live in a world of scarce resources, which some economists call rivalrous. So I don't know if you've ever heard the term rivalry in economics. And uh, so a rivalrous resource is a resource that can only be used by one person at a time whose use excludes other people's use. Rivalry as in fighting, right, or conflict. People would have to fight over this thing. Only one person can use it at a time. 
Okay, now let me turn to the ideas of another great Austrian thinker, or truly great Austrian thinker, uh, Ludwig von Mises, who in my mind is the, one of the greatest geniuses of the 20th century and the, the greatest Austrian thinker of all time. Um, Mises, and I'm not going to go too much in his economics, but Mises analyzed all of economics uh, in terms of what he called human action. So he developed a structure of human action, and he analyzed the logical implications of that action. And I'm not going to go, that's what economics is. It's the analysis of the consequences of human action given what human action is. For today, I'm just going to talk about what human action is, the structure of it. And this is very common sense, by the way, but when you, when you put it down in a precise way and think about it coherently, it helps you solve these IP riddles and things like that. Okay? So he called his logic of human action praxeology, which means the logic of acting. Okay? And the human action is the following. We live in time, right? We move through time. We have a vision about what the future might be that's coming always. We never know for sure. The future is uncertain, but not radically uncertain. And we have an idea about what is coming. And sometimes that upsets us. Sometimes we're, we're uncomfortable with that, right? We have discomfort. Because I imagine that, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little hungry. I'm going to be hungrier in an hour. So you envision, I need to take some action to stop that from happening. I need to get some food. So human action in general is just the use of knowledge about the way the world works to employ scarce resources to achieve something in the end to change the future, basically. That's what human action is. So just keep that in mind. Every action you can think of, everything every human ever does, is the employment of a scarce means or a scarce resource to try to change the course of events so that something in the future happens that otherwise wouldn't happen. This is what we all do on a daily basis in every second of our lives. Okay? So the key thing to keep in mind here is that two ingredients of action are knowledge and, and re scarce resources, or sometimes called scarce means. You have to have both to have successful action. Successful action is the achievement of a profit, but it doesn't have to be monetary, it can be psychic profit. It just means you have an idea in mind, this is what the future is going to hold, this is what I want it to do, I'm going to take some steps to achieve that end. You know, If I want to eat, I want to eat a cake, I need to either make a cake, or purchase a cake, or steal a cake, or something, but I need to take some action to get a cake. And then that would be my end, okay? So this is, uh, this is the way humans act. I'm setting the stage for why property rights emerge and then how we can think about intellectual property. Okay? So now, what I just described is true of any man. It has nothing to do with society. This is true of all intelligent human actors. Even Robinson Crusoe, alone on his desert island, the only person in the world with no society, no community, no humans around him, even he has to act. He uses means, and, and by the way, so the means, for example, would be his body and also tools. Like a, he might make a net, or he might make a knife, or he might build a tent. He might make a net to catch fish because he wants food. So Robinson Crusoe possesses scarce resources in addition to his body and uses those using his knowledge of what's possible. If he didn't know that, that fish were a source of nutrition, he wouldn't try to catch a fish. So he has to have knowledge that fish are, are nutritious. If he didn't know it was possible to catch a fish, or by building a net to make it more efficient to catch a fish, he wouldn't know how to build a net to do it. So you see, the more knowledge you have, the more rich uh, set of recipes and ideas you can draw on to make your action more efficient. You know which ends to pursue, you know which tools to try to use. But the point is, if he catches this fish, he did it because he had accurate knowledge about the, about the way the world works, and he had available means to use to catch the fish. So he's using the pole, he's using the fence, he's using uh, uh, a knife to cut the fish, he might use a fire to cook the fish, etc. Right? So not, successful action is always the combination of knowledge or information or recipes, you can call it whatever you want, and scarce resources or scarce means. Okay? Now, we don't live on islands usually by ourselves. We live in, um, among other humans in society, you can call it society. And there's advantages to living with other people, right? We get companionship, uh, we can trade with people, we can cooperate, we can help each other out. There's a division of labor, there's a specialization of labor, uh, we can have families, makes life meaningful, etc. So there's reasons to live in society, but as long as there's one other person in the world other than yourself, what do we have? We have the Conan situation. We have the possibility of conflict. 
We still need to use our knowledge to decide what to do, and we need to employ scarce resources in the world to achieve our ends. But now this scarce resource might be something someone else wants. So there's a scarce resource I want to use, a well, a piece of land, a cow, a spear, a chair, my own body. Other people might want that too. Some man might want a woman to be his slave. Someone might want uh, uh, my piece of land to grow, to grow their cows on. And if we don't agree on what to do, the only solution can be violence and clashing. Okay. But there's another way to solve that problem, and in society, when people tend to have empathy for each other because of the way we've evolved uh, and because of the benefits of having uh, uh, cooperative relationships with other humans rather than uh, eternal fighting, there's a different way to handle the problem of scarce resources. Now, the problem, again, of scarce resources is that there's only so much to go around, and the only way to solve the problem is either fighting or something else, and the something else is we, we so socially agree on a set of rules that specify, look, if there's a resource out there that more than one person wants, we're going to have a rule that says who owns that resource. And the person that's the owner of that resource gets to use it. Okay, And then boundaries are set up around things. So this is how property emerges, the institution of property. So the entire purpose of property is to set rules on who gets to use things that otherwise people would have to physically violently clash over to use. Okay, so this is what property rights are. Now, we, when, you, when you start using tools, we are intelligent humans. We don't live naked in the world using our claws and our mouths and our, our fists for everything, right? We have clothing, we have accommodations, we have uh, weapons, we have other tools that we use, and those become associated with us, right? They become so-called an extension of yourself because you use it so much to achieve things in the world. If I want to achieve a result, I need to use my body, but I need to use all these other tools. So we start thinking of these things as part of ourselves, as part of our identity, as an extension of ourselves, right? You could call it a feature of myself. Like if I'm a guy that walks around with a knife all the time and I'm, or a hatchet and I'm really good at using it, that's an aspect of my identity. It's a feature of myself, a characteristic. Or what you might call, it's a property of myself. It's one of my properties. Okay, so my gun, my knife, my fishing net, how I, use, how I, how I, uh, they're how I control the world, okay? So I rely on them just like I rely on my hands. So what we could refer to these things that are owned objects, right, or objects that are used to achieve ends, we could refer to them as a property of the owner. Now, I don't mean it's a piece of property, like this computer is a piece of property. I mean it's a feature of this person. It's a, it's a property of the person, okay? So we say words like the owner of a resource has a proprietary interest in the resource, which is why we have the word like a sole proprietor or the proprietor of, a, of an inn, right? Uh, so you have the word properties built into a proprietor, the controller, the one who has, who it is proper that has the control over it, okay? Now, what happens is, over time, people start using the word property to refer to the object that's owned. So technically speaking, I would say, this is a scarce resource, this computer. Um, I control it to achieve ends. And in society, I don't want anyone else to take it from me. I want to be the one to use it, okay? So the, the legal rules say that I am the owner of this computer. Or you could say I have a property right in the computer. But what the common parlance, people would say this is my property. Now, they don't mean it's a property of me. They mean it's a piece of property. So they start using the word property to, as a synonym for the object. So I own that object. I own that property. That's really a little bit of a distortion about how the concept of property arose. It's not too harmful except when it muddies the water with regard to intellectual property, which I'll get to in a minute. I mean, it would be odd, right, to say, uh, uh, this, this, this is my feature. Who would call this my feature? So some say, well, that's your property. They would say, well, that's your feature. It's just as odd to the ear, but it's really the same thing, right? Oh, th that's, your, that's your characteristic. It, th this is my aspect. It just doesn't make any sense, right? So just be careful when you think about the word property when you refer to an object, like a car, as a piece of property, what you're really saying is that is a scarce resource, 
and the owner of it is the guy that has the property right in it. That's really the right way to think about these things, okay? So what does a system of property rights do, or law? See, that's what law is. All law uses force to determine, a dis to settle a dispute, and all disputes are always over scarce resources. And only scarce resources can be things that can be fought over, right? If things were infinitely abundant, there could be no fights. So all law is just a property rights system, and the purpose of the property rights system is simply to answer a question. When there's a dispute between two or more people about who owns some identifiable thing, the, the, the legal system answers the question, who owns it? That's it. Everything in society, every part of the legal system can ultimately be boiled down to that. Is there's, the legal system will generate some answer to the question, who owns that resource? Okay. And quoting Bastiat, which uh, you mentioned him earlier as one of my influences, Frederick Bastiat was a, a, a great uh, French uh, economist and political theorist in the in the 1800s. Uh, he has a quote which I like: "Property does not exist because there are laws, but laws exist because there is property." Now, what he's getting at, he's he's fighting off the socialists here who think that uh, property rights, in their view, is a is an artificial institution generated by the state. And yeah, sir, go ahead. Don't forget the axiom of the idiot said the earth liberation fund who said property is death. Right. And, and this, this is, he, yeah, so uh, there's a statement, and, and Proudhon, I think, was one of the ones who was famous for popularizing the expression uh, property is theft. Now, this is a little bit of an aside. I think there is a sense in which uh, that statement is accurate in the sense that. If the state comes in and assigns property rights in a way that effectively takes property from existing owners and gives it to someone else, then you can see that the roots of the property of these people that were favored by the state, they do lie in a type of theft. And I think one of the things that the, uh, the leftists uh, were upset about in the beginning was the enclosure movement, like in Britain so you, or in Italy and countries like this. So you have these natural rights that arise over time where people can hunt on the common lands, they can travel across, and the government comes in and starts giving these richer guys uh, the right to put up a fence and stop these people from using it, right? And so the idea is that when you do that, you're taking away, so you, what you could say is that before that happened, the right to this land was sort of distributed. Some people had an easement right over it, or a partial right to go across it to get from here to there, over a long used path, or to hunt. Uh, and the guy that had the, the house or the castle there had the right to live on it, but he had to tolerate these uses, so it was sort of a mixed use. But if the government comes in and gives all the rights to one guy, then it's taking the rights away from the people that had somewhat of a right before. So there's an, el there's an aspect to the complaint that property is theft, but of course now it's used by the leftists to just, they hate the whole idea of property rights. Yes? Yes. Yes, and that often happens too, and that happens even today, right? You know, in a sense, that's the re that's the result of the entire idea of property taxes. I mean, none of us really own our property; we just lease it from the government. And if we don't pay our rent, they'll take the property from us. So the government acts like the landlord now. Yeah. Hey, David, go ahead. Yeah. I guess you would say if the was more correct, you would say some property. Yeah. Is yeah. Yeah. Yes, the definition. absolutely, and I totally agree with that. And the other, you know, the other problem is a, a lot of the leftists, uh, they oppose the idea of ownership of land in general. So even if there's a virgin territory and I just you know, take a few acres and, and turn, a, turn it into a farm, they would say that uh, I still don't own it. I have like some kind of usufruct over it. And you know, the Georgists come in with their kind of quasi-leftist notions, and they say that you didn't create the land, so you don't own it, and therefore you have to pay a rent to the community, which is basically like a property tax. So, yeah, and I would reject all that. I think that there's nothing wrong with owning land. I'm just saying that in some cases in the past, the actions of the state have resulted in basically what's expropriation. And the only reason you can oppose expropriation is if you support property rights in the first place. So to oppose theft, you do have to favor property rights in general. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I'd just like to throw in a comment. I saw an interesting uh, example of uh, where you have common some South American country 
where the land was common, and they decided uh, people wanted to build homes. So they said, we will allocate, the government would define property, here's your house, here's your land. Now the person had an asset they could go finance to buy materials to build a house. Quite often, the new homeowner would go broke, and, and then later suggested that it was a way for corporations to come in and buy up the land. Yeah, <laughs> it could be. You know, well, yeah, cor corporations are often in bed with the state, of course. So. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, l I've heard like Walmart, for example, uh, Walmart's in favor of the minimum wage increase, but it's only because they pay more than the minimum wage and it wouldn't hurt them, but it would hurt their competitors. So a lot of times big, big corporations are in bed with big government. I mean, we can be capitalists and pro-free enterprise, but we don't have to assume that these corporations are lily white. Yes? When did uh, property rights start? I remember reading uh, the Native Americans had no property. They couldn't understand the, the, uh, how can you own the land. I think that's a that, that's a that's a more of a, cl uh, a, cl a classification question in the sense that, uh, so for example, some some political theorists say that the, the modern state didn't emerge until about 300 years ago, so they wouldn't call the early Roman Empire a state. So this is a, it depends on how you want to classify things. But from a libertarian point of view, you know, it, we just have more simplistic and clean concepts. We're saying, listen. When you have organized force in any kind of institutionalized way, that's a, effectively a state or a government. So, of course, there were states before that. And, and likewise, uh, uh, just because the, the Native Americans didn't, they were nomadic, right? They were more nomadic. They didn't stay on land at any time. I, wouldn't say, I, I would say they, don't, they didn't have a full-blown theory of property like we have now, and they didn't use it as we use it now because they didn't need to. They wandered around. Um, but, of course, to the extent they were, they were the first to use a resource, and were there for a while on it, I would say that they had a property right in that, at least temporarily. But if they didn't want to keep it, if they wanted to move on, they basically abandoned where they were before, something like that. So I would say they have property rights. I would just say they didn't have a full-blown institutionalized system of property rights like we do now. Well, plus, plus their structures were uh, portable, where our structures today are not so portable. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Two comments. I, I read that the Colombian, the Indians along the Colombian River had allocated fishing rights. They actually had places where they could fish for the fish right. off the edge of the yep. bank. It was theirs, and it was something that could pass on to the children. And I have to think that the Indians who lived along the coast did not move away. They actually had access to food year round. And they wouldn't have to be like a, a, a plains nomad who had to move and follow the right. buffalo or get away from the winter, et cetera. They would actually. Those along the coast actually had, I don't think had a lot of reason to leave yeah. where they were living. That's possible. I'm, so I'm sure there was some maybe cruder form, but there was a form of property rights. I think property rights have emerged ever since there's been society, ever, ever since there's been a normative aspect to human action. Like when people will look and say, you shouldn't do that, or let's decide what you should have done or what we should do, uh, then property rights emerge almost naturally because we have to. Uh, I think I heard the expression one time, even, even a dog knows if you whether you kick it or trip over it. They know the difference, right? Um, it's, it, people know what uh, control over a resource is and whose it is, you know? Um, but let me get a, more into the details here. Uh, the way we use the word property now, like we would say we're for private property rights, and those damn socialists are not. Technically, everyone is for property rights. Every legal system in the world has a set of property rights because they always provide an answer to the, to the question, who owns that resource? So in communist Russia, there was an answer to the question, who owns that house? It was the government, okay, but there was an answer. So there was some identifiable owner or controller. What makes libertarians, I don't know if you're all libertarians, but what the free market, people who believe in private property, free enterprise, free markets, limited government, uh, capitalism, or what I would call libertarianism, what distinguishes us from what I would say is every other political or legal system in the world is our property allocation rules. It's not that we believe in property and they don't. It's that our property allocation rules are different from theirs. Basically, our property allocation rules are the ones that are simple and emerge from the natural order, and theirs are the ones that invade that and end up, end up basically uh, committing theft or slavery. So. 
what, what are our rules that we believe in? Well, ours are the natural rules that are common sense and that would basically apply to Crusoe on his island, but extend it to a social setting. So Crusoe on his island, he doesn't need anyone's permission to do anything, right? He has full control over his body, and he has full control over whatever resources he can possess and dominate and control, right? And he uses those to his advantage. When society comes into place, to the extent you don't want violence to be the way that we solve disputes, you want there to be rules, we have to decide what those rules are going to be. So when we have this dispute, we go to a, a judge or we go to the community and we say, listen, A and B both want this sheep. We have to decide whose it is. So they have to come up with a rule that settles this dispute. And it can't just be arbitrary. If it's arbitrary, everyone's just going to go back to fighting. The rule has to make sense and have a reason. So there's several things that come into play here, right? We say, well, look, we're having a discussion. I'm controlling my body. You're controlling your body. We're trying to decide what to do. We all want to live and let live and live in peace together. There's an assumption there that we each own ourselves, right? So that's self-ownership. So the, the first natural assumption is everyone owns themselves or their bodies, to be more precise. Okay, so that's self-ownership. So that's the first basic rule of the libertarian vision of private property. And then when the question is not about your body, right, but it's about other things like this chair or a computer or a piece of land or an animal, then the question is there's an external resource there who owns that. And there are three basic rules that have always been part of the natural order and the Western system from time immemorial. They are basically uh, original appropriation, which some people call homesteading. This is Locke's idea, right? That basically if there's something that's unowned and you're the first one to get there and use it, then you have a better claim than anyone else. And how could it be anything, how could it be otherwise? If we're going to have a property system where property rights persist over time and you can be, you can, uh, you can uh, count on the property right, you can't have a rule that the second person that gets there gets it, because then he would just take it from the first, and then why not the third? So the first guy has to have priority. And in fact, if the first guy didn't have the right to own it, nothing would ever be used, because you know, something that's unowned has to be used for the first time for it ever to be put into use. So the natural rule is the first guy that takes a piece of property and starts putting it to productive use is the owner. That's the first rule of ownership. Uh, the second one is consensual transfer, what some people might call contract, right? Um, so basically, if you own something, even if you didn't homestead it, you didn't find it first, if you got it from a previous owner by contract voluntarily, then you're the owner, right? So if someone gives me a gift, or they leave me something in their will, a bequest, or if they sell it to me in a contract, then now I'm the owner, and I have a better claim than anyone in the world, even better than the original owner because he gave it to me. Okay, so that's the second thing. In fact, you could just think of those two, but the third one uh, is what we call rectification or restitution. If I commit an, a, a crime against you or a tort, I damage you in some kind of way such that I owe you compensation, right? I have to pay you back. Well, then you get – you have a property – you have an interest in some of my property, which you need for me to, to, to compensate you for the damage I've done. So those three things are the only rules that we need to look to to determine who the owner of anything is in the world. Anytime there's a dispute between two people, we come together and we say, okay, what are you fighting over? So just by the fact that they're fighting over something concrete, we know what the thing is. So we identify the thing that's, uh, that's in dispute. And then we, then we just go through these three questions. Well, did you find it? Did you buy it from someone who owned it? Or did this guy hurt you so that you owe it to him to pay him back? And you just ask those questions, you get facts, and then you make your answer, right? This is how the property system works. Now, this is basically the, the, the part of the civil law in Europe, the common law in, in England and America. It's been there for hundreds of years. Not perfectly. There have been exceptions, mostly because the state comes in and taxes you, which violates these principles. Now, libertarians are just people that have thought about these things more carefully and apply them more consistently. So even your average person who's not a libertarian they believe in these principles. They don't think you should hurt people. They think people own themselves. They think that if you have something first, you get it. They think if you buy a car, you own it. You know, they believe in this intuitively. They make exceptions because they're not extremely economically literate, and they don't really care too much about being perfectly consistent. Libertarians have an obsession with being 100% perfectly consistent, right? Trying to out libertarian Yeah, exactly, right. We have to weed out deviationists, right? Okay, 
So if you think about it, any legal system like socialism or the welfare state or even a, any tax system, all these rules basically come in and they undercut and undermine uh, uh, those, those property allocation rules I'm talking about. So for example, uh, if the government takes taxes me, they're taking property from me. Now, why does the government have a right to that property? They didn't, they didn't find it, they didn't get it by contract, and I didn't do anything to harm them. So they have no reason to take it from me. So it's just a pure out, act of outright theft. Okay? Um, or if the government says, I'm going to put you in jail if you smoke marijuana or if you don't go fight in this war or if you don't pay taxes, they're enslaving me in effect. If they throw me in a cage, they're treating me like a slave. They're, they're pretending to be the owner of my body, but they're not the owner of my body. I'm the owner of my body. So you see all these deviations, all these socialistic rules. And by the way, I use the word socialistic in a general sense like Hoppe does, Hans Hermann Hoppe, another Austrian uh, economist. Um, to, 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 to Hoppe, socialism is the institutionalized aggression against private property. So in his sense, every state in the world is to some extent socialistic. They just have different flavors. There's socialism Russian style, socialism conservative style, socialism social democratic style, etc. Okay. Now, before we go on, now I'm going to turn to IP, intellectual property. Anyone have any questions right now? Okay, so intellectual property, first of all, it's a, it's a made-up name that, that the defenders of, of these legal systems came up with to defend it from attacks by free market economists in the 1800s. The state, a quick, 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 quick history. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the middle part of, the, say, the 1600s, there was a practice of uh, 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 the, the, uh, the crown granting monopolies to favored court cronies, right? You're the only guy that can sell sheepskin here. You're the only guy who can sell playing cards here. Uh, uh, in exchange for them co helping collect taxes and things like that. So the, the government granted these monopoly rights. They call them letters patent quite often. That's where the word patent, patent means open. So, you know, uh, Sir Francis Drake was given a letter patent to pirate people on the high seas, um, things like that. It got to be abusive, and so the parliament in England enacted the Statute of Monopolies in, I think, 1623 to limit this abuse, but it, it maintained the right of the government to grant monopolies for inventions. Okay, So that's where patents come from. Patents are a government-granted right to be the only one who can practice an invention. And copyright originated in, in the practice of the government and the church combining together to censor free speech. Uh, and the printing press primarily. When the printing press came out, it started threatening the monopoly hold that the church had had using scribes over what thought could get published and given to the masses, which they didn't like. So they, they gave a monopoly to the, uh, the stationer's company, and that finally expired, and that morphed into the Statute of Anne in 1709, which was the first modern copyright law. Statute of Anne, Queen Anne, oh, okay. 1709, 1710. Uh, and then in the U.S., so the U.S., of course, came from this tradition, and in 1789, when the Constitution was enacted, our brilliant founders decided to put into the Constitution uh, a clause giving Congress to enact laws similar to these systems that they had been used to by this point. And the, it's, uh, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution says Congress can, to promote the progress of science in the useful arts, by securing for limited times to authors and inventors of the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. And then soon after, the Congress enacted a patent statute and a copyright statute based upon this grant of authority. Okay, So that's where it came from. But the question is, is this a legitimate type of property? Is it a real property right? Is it a legitimate right? Is it compatible with the basic property rights that I identified before, Right, the test of identifying who gets to use this resource? right? So the way some people frame this question is they'll say, uh, Kinsella, says, uh, uh, Kinsella says intellectual property is not property. That's not the argument. Remember I said earlier that you can get into trouble. I wouldn't say this. Com the, the question is not, if we have a dispute over this computer, is the question, is this property? That's not the question. The question is, we have a dispute over this thing. Who gets to use it? Who's, who has a property right in it? Who is the owner is the question. The question is not, is this property? 
So the problem with patent and copyright laws is not that ideas aren't property, okay? Because this is not property. This is just an object that someone has a property right in. Okay, so that's the, that's the question. So let's look at what copyright and patent really do. L let me take another example that most of you are probably familiar with. Uh, the, the, the practice of having a homeowners associations with restrictive covenants. Everyone's aware of that, right? So you live in a neighborhood and there's some kind of restrictive covenant that says this is, a co this is not a commercial neighborhood, this is for residential purposes, uh, and you can't paint your house some kind of color outside of a certain normal realm, or you can't paint it bright purple, you know, purple and gold. I'm from LSU, so I'd want to do purple and gold, but that'd probably be prohibited in my neighborhood. Now, that is not a violation of property rights because uh, it was agreed to by the original owner of that land, which was the developer, right? And then, then I step into his shoes when I buy it. So a restrictive covenant is perfectly legitimate if it's voluntarily agreed to. Basically, and this is called in the law a negative servitude or a negative easement. So, for example, my neighbor, in effect, is a co-owner of my house, but he can't use it. He can't go into my house with my permission. I use it for everything I want except there are certain things I can't do unless I get my neighbor's permission. So this arrangement is a contractual property arrangement where all my neighbors have a veto right over certain uses of my property. They don't have the right to use it. They have the right to stop me from using it in a certain way, and I have rights over them. So you have, the, you have a contract with what's called a dominant estate and a subservient estate, right? So the, whoever's living in this house has the right to prevent me from using my property in a certain way. This is what restrictive covenants are based upon. This is what negative servitudes and negative easements are, and there's nothing whatsoever wrong with that. People can contractually agree to whatever they want to, but contrast that to zoning. The zoning is people own their property outright, or what we might call allodially, right? That means outright without any government restrictions, and the government comes in and says, you cannot use that property for this use. That's exactly like a negative servitude, but the the problem is no one agreed to it. The owner didn't agree to it. So it's not consensual, it's not contractual. So it's, it's like the difference between uh, me selling you a tennis ball and you taking my tennis ball without my permission. There's, if you take the ball from me after having paid me for it, it's not theft. If you take the ball from me when I say no, it is theft. So the, yeah, go ahead. I encourage the village to do a lawsuit right now with a, a large group of individuals on the south side of the city purchase a uh, purchase property for industrial use. The city came in and rezoned it to basically for city use to create a, a, uh, a shopping center. Totally and completely different. So there's major there's a major lawsuit now. Looks like the city's gonna lose. Well I hope so, but uh <laughs> right. well that's an example. So these are uh, zoning is very similar to taxation because it's a type of Taking of property rights. Um, We're as stupid as the city. Murray Rothbard has an has an interesting uh, taxonomy of of interventionism, and he says that you can classify the way the state intervenes in human life according to three three categories. One's autistic, like autistic means it's between you and the state, and the state's just like saying you can't do drugs, so they're they're just controlling you in some non commercial exchange. exchange. And the other is binary. It's between you and the state, but it's got to do with a commercial. It's a forced transaction. That's an example would be taxes. The government's just taking your property from you, making you give them their property. And the third is, is triangular, where the government compels some kind of uh, trade between two citizens. Okay. Now, for example, the, the government uh, uh, doesn't allow an employer to uh, uh, pay an employee less than minimum wage or something like that. Now, I believe that intellectual property ought to be viewed as, uh, and here I'm talking about patent and copyright primarily. We can talk about trade secret and trademark if we have time, if anyone's interested, but um, patent and trademark are the two worst. They should be viewed, in my view, as a, as a, as a non-consensual negative servitude and as a triangular intervention by the state. Because what happens is, let, let's take the case of patent. Um, I invent a new mousetrap and I get a patent on it from the government. The government grants me this letters patent, this monopoly for 17 years on the, on the only one that has the right to make this kind of um, device. And I start selling it on the market. Now on the free market, what normally happens if you have a new product and you sell it and it's popular, you get competition, right? 
Usually libertarians are supposed to be for competition. But the guy that has the patent can prevent people from competing with them. That's the whole purpose of it is to stop competition. So basically what the patent grants to the patent holder is a negative servitude over everyone else's factories. So he basically has gained a negative servitude. He can veto – he can say, you can't use your factory to make this kind of mousetrap. Now, that's very similar to the restrictive covenant, except the factory owner didn't ever contractually grant that, and he didn't commit a tort against the, the guy. So this is the problem with it. The same with copyright. Uh, if, uh, if, uh, if, if you had the idea for a sequel to Atlas Shrugged and you wanted to publish that tomorrow, you would be sued by the estate of Ayn Rand or Leonard Peikoff probably, or Leonard Peikoff's daughter, uh, under using copyright law, and the court would give an injunction saying you can't publish that book. So effectively what's happened is the government has granted to Peikoff a negative servitude over my printing press, he, or my body even. He's, and he can, he can use government power to issue an order to me to tell me you can't use your printing press that way. Now remember, if we go back to standard free market principles, if Peikoff doesn't want me to use my printing press to print a book, and I do want to use it, then we have a dispute over who gets to use that printing press. Now, if we have a dispute, we go to a court, the libertarian answer would be, well, who owns it? <laughs> who owns the printing press? Who found it? Who bought it? Right? And I did. Leonard Peikoff didn't. All Leonard Peikoff did was inherit the copyright to a book that someone else wrote. So this is ultimately the problem with a copyright and patent is that they, they end up – taking property rights away from legitimate property owners. Um, now notice – and I, this is the, that's the conclusion of the argument uh, – nowhere did I talk about incentives to create or utilitarian considerations uh, because you don't need to go there. That, the, the, normal, the normal argument you'll hear is, well, without copyright, no one would write books. Without patents, no one would invent anything, which is a utilitarian argument. But and the argument is false, by the way, but it's, got, it's not even a libertarian argument because the question of law is not how do we make sure people are inventing enough. The question of law is how do we protect property rights and do justice, right? And the way you protect property rights and do justice is you protect property rights in things people have acquired legitimately, and you let them use it as however they want as long as they do not trespass on other people's property. It's that simple. Okay, so I'll conclude here, and if there's any questions, we can talk farther, further. I have a copyright and I've got, uh, I mean a copyright registration and that's the way it should be looked at. I registered a copyright. I could register my car or boat or anything else. That's a claim that I have uh, that it's my property. Okay, but it's not the you know you kind of twisted to me what you're talking about the government doing this because all the government is doing or all they're supposed to be doing they may be overstepping their bounds in some cases, but that's a different issue. What they're supposed to be doing is registering my claim to that, that I was the first one to do this, which is, as you say, you know, who's first? So I was the first one to do this, so then I have primary rights over, you know, whatever this is that I did. So the copyright is that somebody else can not use exactly what I did, but they can, unfortunately, they can copy my idea, and they did. But anyway, the, uh, the point is, is that if, if I find somebody in violation or I consider that they're the government doesn't go out and say, oh, you, you violated Wayne's copyright. I have to see that they violated them, and then I have to go sue them, and then I can use in court the fact that I had registered this copyright, and that proves that I had it in 1992. So if they can show that they had it in 1976, well, then my copyright will just be erased. That's all done in court. It isn't a government thing. And uh, to me, it's, it's, it's the right way to do it because we should be doing this in civil action in a court rather than the government having an agency telling somebody what to do. Okay. This is quite a bit different from zoning, I would say, where, this, where the government is telling me what I can and can't do with my property. Well, I predicted you would disagree, so <laughs> people here would disagree with me. Um, I totally disagree with what you just said. Um, there's. There's no problem with registering a copyright. The problem is when it gets enforced. Okay, when you enforce a copyright, you're using government force against – look, there's a guy in jail for uploading a copy of the Wolverine movie. He went to jail for a year. He's in pr federal prison for that. You know, for, for what? Uploading a copy of the Wolverine movie. I mean there's all kind of crazy uh, 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 things. The, 
Uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Question. Yes. If I write a uh, poem. Uh, Say again? You write a what? If I write a poem. A poem? It's my property. I wrote it. It came from me. And I'm reading it. I get to choose who I share it with. I would think, thinking about it, that I'm the owner of these, this right. I get to share who I, or choose who I share it with. If you take it away from me because just because you, you think your printing press buys you the right, you have a right to use your printing press, and I don't have a right to use your printing press. Correct. But I have a right to choose who I share these thoughts with. It's really hard to do once you make it public. If you keep it secret, of course, or if it's private, you know. If you, I would say you never own the poem. You own the piece of paper you wrote it on. You and you and the information is. You don't own a thought. Well, under today's legal system, you do. Under today's legal system, you do because there's copyright. I'm saying copyright and patent should be abolished. I'm asking the question because this is the way it hits me: is if you think I'm the owner of myself, I'm the owner of myself. You're the owner of your body, to be precise. Well, I'd say I'm the owner of my body, but you might extrapolate that and say I'm the owner of what I create. But you're not. This is the mistake. This is the mistake. Well, uh, show me how that's wrong. Okay, so, yeah, uh, uh, there's a, it's commonly said, and Locke said this too, I think he was mistaken as well. You own yourself, which he should have said you own your body. You own yourself, therefore you own your labor, which is not true. You don't own your labor. Labor is just an action. It's, it's strange to say I own my actions. Your actions are what you do with your body. You own your body, but your action is just what you do with it. It doesn't make any sense to say you own your actions. That's just like a process. Okay, and so then he said you own your actions, you own your labor, and therefore you own things you mix your labor with. Okay, that's how he, got, that's how he justified Lockheed and homesteading. But then people extrapolate from that and they say, well, that means you own what you create, which is what you just said, which is a very common argument. You don't own what you create. You only own what you appropriate in the world that was not owned or what you acquire from someone by contract we do not own what we create there's just there's no reason to say that i'm not going to disagree with you or agree with you <laughs> <laughs> yeah go ahead i like to say i have a patent on the thoughts in your head right now why don't you pay up <laughs> but it, anyway uh I, I think uh this is going a little bit farther you've, you've provided a lot of insight that i, I found really interesting uh, some years ago, I read into what has been going on legally in uh, national and international copyrights and patents, where the uh, uh, copyrights, for example, they are extending the uh, lifetime of it, and it's getting to the point to where it's really getting long. Uh, and I think it was in the recent uh, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, they threw another international uh, uh, law yeah. enforcing it. This is, and in my opinion, this is getting to the point to where they're going to shut down libraries. It, it's not, well, <laughs> you know, okay, it, for, it's first of all, it's, <laughs> well, it, it's not just that that was part of, the, I think that was the whole purpose of the TPP was to, to extend America's IP system at the behest of our pharmaceutical companies oh, yeah. and publishing industry in Hollywood. Uh, two other countries and, and the original copyright system was 14 years extendable up to 14 more years if the author was still alive does anyone know why that was the original one. the original and it's way beyond now that. it's life plus 90 but, oh i thought it was like 150 years well life plus 90 is roughly depends oh, okay okay yeah. so <laughs> people people and just they want to extend it farther than that they're trying to go farther uh, but does anyone know why the copyright term and the patent term was 14 years too they were both 14 years it's because a typical apprentice would serve for seven years. So the idea was that you train an apprentice, and you don't want your apprentice to learn what you're doing and go out and compete with you. So you need to have at least two apprentice lifetime or you know, seven-year terms of monopoly protection before they, your apprentices run out and start competing with you. Okay. So they just doubled that. And then, then they doubled, they've extended it over the years. Uh, it was extended in the 80s under the Sonny Bono Act. Remember the guy, the, the Republican that hit, ran into a tree, right. snow skiing? Yeah, mysteriously. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, go ahead, David. <laughs> yeah. Following up on your, your comments about you don't own what you create, and I think you may have a little bit of nuance on this one. What if I uh, create a trademark for something that I manufacture? Don't I own that trademark? 
Under today's legal system, you do. I believe trademark law is completely uh, unlibertarian and should be abolished. Yeah, because tra trademark law, people say that it's justified because uh, you have to stop fraud. Well, we have something for that. We, it's called fraud law. We already have fraud law, and we already have contract law. Those two things alone are all you need to stop fraud. So trademark law adds something else. And what at, trademark law is very similar to defamation law. It basically sets up a reputation right. What trademark law really tries to do is give uh, companies and, uh, and a, a property right in their reputation, which is exactly what libel law does, right? When you sue someone for uh, slandering your reputation, and most libertarians are against libel law because they understand that for me to have a property right in my reputation means I have to own your head, your brain, because I can control what you think about me. So but essentially what you're saying is trademarks are superfluous. They're what? They're not only superfluous, they're harmful because they're used by large companies to, to, to bully and to stop, to stop competition. A, a good example is the Olympic, the term Olympic. The, the federal government passed a law to the Olympic Committee, and then they went and shut down all the businesses in this country. Well, what about the Super Bowl? We're the Super Bowl, we have to call it the big game because you'll get sued by the right, Super Bowl. Right. It's ridiculous, <laughs> by the NFL. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Lewis. Copyright law, yeah, you're right. They, they stole their, 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 their income they should go to solve and should receive from writing this operetta. Are you saying that this kind of law should not apply at all? Yes, because, because see, China, China, as they say today, is stealing ideas and, and copyright for uh, the internet. No, but notice what you said. You, 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 you hit it right on. You said they stole the money they should have received. Okay, now. You know, if I have a pizza joint and then a competing pizza joint opens up across the street and they steal my customers, I mean, I didn't really own those customers, right? The competition with me did reduce the amount of money I could have made, but I didn't have a property right in that money because that money is owned by potential future customers. Same with this, this musical production. The, you say the money they should have made, but the money was owned by the people that attended the, the musical. Yeah, no one has a property right in that money except for the owners. Correct. You're saying that the creativity is public in the public domain. Yes, yes, 100%. The creativity has deserved no remuneration. No one deserves anything. I agree with that. No one deserves to make a profit at running a pizza joint either. I don't agree with that. Well, I don't know. I figured I, well, we could disagree with <laughs> Yes, sir. You were, you were talking about somebody going to jail for copyright. I really wish you'd elaborate on that. I've got a whole bunch of blog posts about it. There, well, first of all, uh, Aaron Schwartz, the guy that, uh, oh, wow. he, he committed suicide yeah. because he was going to federal prison. I was talking about that just earlier. For copying so scholarly right. articles. Everybody um, needs to know about uh, This guy, I think he's out of jail and he went to jail for a year. It was uh, Wolverine. There's a guy named Wayne uh, something Dwyer, D-W-Y-E-R. He was a British grad student who published a website which had hyperlinks to someone else's website which had pirated movies or something on it. And the United States ruined his graduate. They were trying to extradite the guy to face federal prison here in the US. He had to f fight off the federal government of the US for years. Um, Kim.com was raided by the uh, FBI and three other government's agencies in New Zealand because of uh, Mega, Mega.com or whatever it's called, the Mega Upload uh, service that he had. These are all for copyright. Copyright is a criminal. A, a big time criminal problem. Well, that's not in the Constitution anyway. I, I have a feeling, I mean, you're covering a lot of stuff here. I mean, somebody's using it, and, you know, I mean, there are other things like you talk about mail fraud or, you know, violation of computer rules, things like that. I mean, I well, don't know really what you're talking about because I don't see any law that says that if you violate, somebody violates my copyright, they don't go to jail for it. I sue them for it. That's, there are civil, but there's criminal actions too. It can be prosecuted both well, ways. If I went and I, I went to court and I got an injunction against them from using it, no. they violated the injunction. No, there's a there's a criminal action that can be taken. It's, it's a criminal it's a criminal well, offense then, as well. Then I think you should be arguing against that, not arguing against copyright in general. Why sh why should I not be able to sue somebody if they violated 
if they expropriated what I you, my, you know what I wrote. You should be able to sue them. You just shouldn't be able to win. <laughs> because they did, you see, you use the word expropriate, which is question begging. The expropriation is a type of theft. If it's theft, it, impl it implies you owned it. So that's the whole argument is that I don't think you own. Listen, remember earlier I tried to distinguish successful action is the combination of using knowledge and using scarce resources. So scarce resources are the things people can fight over, and that's why property rights arise in those things. Knowledge is not that kind of thing. A, a million people at once can use the same idea. It's not a scarce resource. Yes? When we made drawing for a building, we have proper rights to that. Yes. And you're saying you need somebody else to use it that you're not going to be able to do it? I, I believe the, the copyright system should be abolished, and then people can use information freely. I don't think it's a crime or it's a wrong to use knowledge. If someone releases information into the world somehow and it gets out there, others should be free to use it. That's fine, but it's going to, you know, if the, na the nature of information is that someone just needs to make a copy and put it on the internet, and then billions of people have access to it. But you don't own your creativity. That's your idea. Yes, that's my opinion. Second? Yes. Correct. Uh, it's the Protestant idea, right? The, the more you work, the more you should make. I, I mean, it, there's no right to money. There's no right to an income. There's no right to get rewarded for your labor. Wait, he had one too. You go ahead. Well, this is libertarian. I may be out. I'm trying to understand now. Okay. Uh, if I take my printing press and I go get your book and I make an exact copy of it. Yes. And go out and sell it. Yes. Maybe I make a copy of it and I say buy Alan Robo instead of. So, yes. Uh, uh, do you have any objection to that? No. <laughs> well, let's look it up. Okay. No objection whatsoever. All my work is CC zero, which means I don't even require attribution. You can change the name. I don't care. Another example that I like to hear you comment on, and uh, it's the uh, property land property people in. I think it was Nevada, where the Bureau of Land said it's federal land, and the family said, our families have been using the land for a very long time, and now the uh, government wants to sell the land to another company, okay. and to sell it, you got to leave the land, and it's, it's been going on since the creation of the country, and again, we're getting down to original owners, mm -hmm. and the short story, they were expanding uh, they went to Oregon and were helping those people, you know, with the same legal problems. And then the uh, Bureau of Land Management sent the cops in, ambushed the family, and killed them on the spot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and solved that problem. But at any rate, the dispute was over the land. And this guy was very constitutionally literate, and he was, you know, backing everything he did. And so they shut him up really good. You're familiar with the case? No. Oh, no, I'm sorry oh, not. Oh, man. It's, you don't want to go against the government. But I, I mean, uh, the bottom line, you know, in, in, in England with the feudal system, the way it works is the king is the overlord. Okay? Literally, he's the, the overlord, and then it filters down to the, the, the landholders, the, which are mere tenants, right? Um, and in the U.S., when we broke off from Britain, right. some of the states, there's, I've got a blog post That's on this. Uh, there's a guy named. Cor property. Cornelius Moynihan wrote, he's got an interesting book on, on, on this. Some of the states um, specifically uh, passed statutes putting the, the state government in the place of the king, so now they're technically the overlord. In the other states, they declared the property to be allodial. Right. However, even that's, uh, that's not really true because all these states have property tax and they can take your property through eminent domain. Right. So in every state in the U.S. and every state in the world, the government is the real overlord of all property. No one owns their property a load of You don't even own your body a load of because the government can put you in jail for not paying taxes or not showing up for war or for uh, for smoking the wrong kind of drugs. Right, right. So, yeah. And, and one other thing I want to bring up, there's a gentleman out in, in uh, Sugar Land who invented a cancer treatment, uh, Stan, I forgot his Brzezinski. name. Excuse me? Brzezinski. 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 And he has been taken to court about a dozen plus times, and finally they solved the case. The U.S. government patented his work. 
Have you heard about that case? No, I haven't oh, heard about that. Yeah, I couldn't. U.S. patent, shut up. Now, they're not doing anything to him, but they just don't want this idea to go beyond. Well, what's interesting is the U.S. government has uh, some uh, marijuana, me medical marijuana patents. Oh, well, so they actually have a patent they issued to themselves, basically validating how useful medical marijuana is while they're criminalizing it at the same and, time. And so you, you can't use it because we have the patents. <laughs> Plus, it's and illegal. you can't use his, this guy's cures, which are very successful. Right. And, bec and, and because the government doesn't want you to. It's very freaky. Yeah. With regard to uh, use of other persons, someone else to try to profit, Texas has squatters' rights, doesn't it? Most yeah, most states have a form of yeah. Right. Well, you have to have that because people abandon things sometimes without giving a declaration. They just disappear, and at a certain time, at a certain point in time, the, the law has to decide what's going to happen with this property. So it t it tends to have these statutes of uh, limitations or acquisitive prescription. We call it in civil law, where over a certain amount of time, if the owner never tried to kick them off or policed his property, we assume he's gone or didn't care. Yep. This brings up my earlier story about Texas claiming the uh, unused bank accounts. This is abandoned property. The state steps in and claims it for itself. Yep. In the case of, of land, which is uh, the squatter's right, a private pro person can actually sit on land, pay tax dollars, and then file for a deed. That's under, under squatter's law. What, what do we have in the case of an abandoned bank account? I don't know the exact law on that, but I think it's similar. I think at, at a certain point in time, if no one comes forward to claim it, then whoever found it. No, it's a bank account. The, the, the government said that money, uh, accounts are not being uh, used. We will claim the money for ourselves. That might be treated like a, what's called is cheat in, 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 in wills and estates law, right? If you. If you don't have a will, it goes to your kids. If you don't have kids, it goes to your parents. If you don't have parents, and then if there's no one left that you can presume, it goes to the state. That's called a cheat. In this case, it's not a will. It's simply after a period of time, and that yeah. account is not active, the government takes the money. Uh, well, I, I don't know to say. That's the government. I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> how would this apply to the issue that Barry brought up much earlier about the uh, uh, the what? Sorry. A human being dies. His organs are oh. available for harvest. Right. Except there's no one to ask. Uh, is, has he abandoned his property? Does uh, the person who finds his property then have the right to, to uh, harvest? Yeah, that's a. I mean, my view on that. I believe that you know, I think you should. People should have the right to have a will which specifies what's going to happen. Uh, the problem is, in some cases, someone doesn't have a will, or you can't find it, or someone's got to make a decision right now, and they don't know. So the law has to have default rules that specify, if we just don't know, what's the presumption going to be? Now, what the presumption should be, I don't know. I, I have never met a person, very rarely met a person, who would, who would not want their organs to go to help someone if they had to. I mean, some people don't put it on their car, but most people are not against it. Um, so I would think that if you have to make a judgment, this guy's dead. We, we don't know what his identity is. We don't know who to call. He doesn't have a will on him. If we don't use his heart now, someone else is going to die. What would, this guy have, what would this guy have wanted? It might be reasonable for the, for the courts or for the, for the law to say the presumption is he's consented, and then they take it. Now, let's, so let's say we have that rule and people don't like it. They think that's horrible. I, I, my, one of my neighbors died, and they took his heart. So people are just going to start having wills. They're going to start, well, I better go do a will to change that presumption. So the, the benefit of presumptions is that you can at least overcome them. But the law has to have some presumptions. I, I, I don't know if there's a, 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 an a priori answer to the right presumption. My presumption would be, since the government's involved, I would probably say you have to leave it alone and respect, it, respect his body and assume that he hasn't given permission, right? And if he had wanted to get permission, he could have worn one of those little bracelets or something like that, right? But if the presumption goes the other way, then I would just contract around it with my own methods if I had to. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, Protestant idea is that uh, if a person, the, longer, the more the person works, the more you should get paid. Well, there's a parable in Matthew 20 where the uh, vineyard uh, owner went out at 10 o'clock, 
two, yeah. eight, eight o'clock, ten o'clock, two o'clock, to four o'clock, something like that, hired laborers. At five o'clock when he went home, he paid all the laborers the same thing. He said it's up to the, the person who's paying to what they're going to pay. So, it's, so that's a little bit different concept. Well, I mean, you know, in physics, if you push against the wall, you're not doing work because you're not moving an object through a distance, right? But you're straining and all this. Um, I just, people don't reserve, deserve a return on their labor. Actually, it's more of a Marxist, if you think about it, the idea that you deserve a reward for your labor is, is very close to Marxism. The Marxist idea of the labor theory of value, set, you know, they don't like the free market, which basically puts a value on things of whatever the buyer is willing to pay, right? They think that the value of an item is based upon the amount of labor hours put into it. Now, so if I spend a lot of time building, building some device that's, that's, that's junk and no one wants to buy it, then they have to modify their theory to come up with an excuse for that. But the idea that the value of an object is based upon the amount of labor put into it is Marxian and wrong. And that's, well, that's the essence behind this idea that people deserve a reward for their labor. They don't deserve anything. I studied economics about this much, but I do remember one thing they told me in economics about certain items are commodities. Like, for instance, they used the example of eggs. You can go to the eggs, you can find a dozen eggs at Kroger, at HEB, or at Walmart. A dozen eggs are going to be the same price. It's the same price. The reason they're the same price is because there's such a wide use of it. They have to compete and narrow the gap. Otherwise, the guy with the lowest price gets all the business. Yep, that's true. So. Well, but, but we're a laborer and thinking how, how we can lower the cost when you tell it cheaper. Uh -huh. that's, that's, a, that's a scale of economic, uh, 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 scale, a magnitude of scale where the guys got the biggest operation can produce items. Economies of scale, cost. yeah. yeah. So yeah. he'll be rewarded for his labor because he'll get more profit. Yeah. Seems fair to me. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Let, let me ask you about international business law. I, I talked earlier about admiralty law. There's no relationship. you know anything about admiralty law? Yeah, a little bit. I'm, I'm from Louisiana, and there's a lot of admiralty cases there. Admiralty law is not the same as international law. Uh, it's the law of the sea, basically, how we control vessels and trade over the ocean. So there's international aspects to it, but it's, it's, a, it's a specialized subset of international business law, I'd say. But I have heard these kind of kooky conspiracy theories that we're under admiralty jurisdiction because if you go into a federal courtroom, there's a gold fringe on the flag. Oh. <laughs> it's just some common law nut. It's, it's well, why is there a gold fringe on the flag? All the flags I see are, are I, no fringes. I, I don't know. I don't know. But I've heard that that means we're under admiralty jurisdiction, whatever that means. Which I, ran, I think I ran across that. That came up in uh, uh, something like, uh, you know, one of those popular crime shows, Bones. I don't. What's what is that? Historical district. What do you? Set up that you can't change anything inside unless you're maintaining the same. Z zoning. Yeah, oh, zoning. Twenty-two historical district. The idea, I guess, is that we all have it's all part of our common heritage, so we get to control what the property owners inside a district can do. So they can't alter them very much. Well, uh, the, 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 I think the libertarian position is pretty uh, pretty uh, universal on this. It's right. libertarians uh, almost compl universally uh, oppose any form of zoning whatsoever. We have zoning in Houston. We just don't call it zoning. It's a softer form of zoning, right? There's a network of regulations and permissions you have to go through. It's not quite the same as simple zoning where they dictate what you can or cannot do with your property. They can limit how you use your property. We actually have some zoning behind the Galleria, there's a, a, a deters, it's actually from a reinvestment zone. They got zoning before we prohibited zoning back in 1993. So they got zoning there. And there's something like zoning around the airports. The federal government says you're regulating to go where people to live close to airports, so you need to restrict development there so people are, are not disturbed yep. uh, by plane noise. Yes. Um, <coughs> It brings up what I was talking about, my other cousin who ran for uh, uh, Congress and saying that libertarians don't want to win. Um, I'm looking at you and you're saying, well, we're disagreeing. And yet if, yet if we were to look at almost any law that's been around, 
in, the, in our lifetimes, for instance, I would guess that we would be on the same side on every case. I yep. mean, I would, I mean, this idea of the extension from 58 years or whatever to, you know, and especially when it's corporations and not individuals, you know, if we could scale back to something on the, on the, uh, uh, you know, I mean, you're saying do away with it all, that would do away with, say, 100% of it. If we could do away with what's been added in the last 100 years, we'd probably be getting, doing away with 60% of it. I think that would be an easier sell, you know? Well, and you know, we, we did, the libertarians and the, the civil libertarians and the tech libertarians did have some success in defeating SOPA. If you remember the Stop Online Piracy Act, which is about five years ago. Again. SOPA, Stop Online Piracy Act. There was, a, there was an attempt to get this, uh, uh, this, this federal law enacted, which would have radically restricted our Internet usage rights in the name of stopping copyright piracy. And the Internet had an uprising. There was all these websites that had Stop SOPA, and they went, their websites went down for a day, and Congress backed off. Although they tried to put a version of that into the TPP. It, it would have been in there. It's, it's going to come eventually. But this is basically – look – I'm a patent lawyer, copyright lawyer. I've done this for a living, right? The reason I came to these views is because I was I, I never could find a good argument for this stuff when I was becoming a libertarian. And I kept thinking about it in law school. Then I started practicing this. So I kept thinking about it like this argument doesn't work. Like this argument's wrong. This every argument for intellectual property. And finally I realized why. It's because it's and it's not just a small thing. To my mind, it, uh, it's like one of the top six worst things the government does to us. It's up there with war, the drug war, taxation, public schools, and the Federal Reserve. I mean, it is bad. Patent law, my, my, my guess is patent law probably costs the economy a trillion dollars a year in lost wealth because of the reduction of innovation. It is serious. Copyright law doesn't hurt us that much, but it severely distorts the economy, and it limits the spread of knowledge, and it's threatening Internet freedom. And Internet freedom is one of the most important things we have to fight the government. And if the government's going to start using copyright as an excuse to limit our Internet freedom, then it's a huge strike against liberty. It's very, so copyright law is worse even, I think, than patent. And, and yeah. um, more, I was going to say, more importantly, the book you wrote that you copyrighted, you would not have been able to have written the book and copyrighted it because someone else already had those thoughts before you. So you're saying uh, you're trying to protect your book, and in those same yeah, it's like I'm saying you would have never had the book. People, people who get into paradise shut the gates behind them, right? right? They, right. You, people want to be free to use all the the wealth of ideas, the fund of ideas that we've inherited from human civilization, right? That. And you want to build on, so it's like this huge mountain of ideas, and you want to stay right on top, and then stop anyone going forward from using your stuff without your permission. And that's what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, my problem. I'm looking at the. I don't know. I'm looking at the kind of. If I'm coming up with a new idea, or I want somebody else to come up with new ideas, the way you encourage them spending their time and money trying to pull pull something out of the ground or out of their heads is the patent and the copyright laws that after they do it and it's new, they can, they can set it up and if it makes them a million bucks, then but it, but, but, it's but, a new idea. But that's actually not, not what you just said is factually untrue. Um, it is not true that people write books because there's a copyright system. It's not true that people come up with innovations because there's a patent system. It's just empirically not true. Okay. It, it actually, uh, there's studies of that. I can give you links to tons of studies and research on this. Yeah. I think it was semi-authoritative in answer to the fringe on the flag. <laughs> President Eisenhower says that according to uh, USC Chapter 1, Sections 1, 2, and 3, Executive Order 108034, August 21 of 1959, the military flag is a flag that resembles the regular flag but has a gold fringe around the outside. So the gold fringe around the outside of the flag means it's a military flag. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, yeah. Any comments on the concept of plagiarism? Yeah, pl uh, plagiarism has literally nothing to do with copyright or with patent infringement. People all often use that argument, just like, like they'll use the fraud argument to justify trademark law. They'll say, well, if you get rid of – we need trademark because we have – fraud is bad. And then if you point out, but there's already fraud law, so, so that argument doesn't work. And so people say, well, uh, like your, your comment about taking my book and putting your name on it, that's plagiarism. Okay? Now, plagiarism is not illegal. 
for example, if you take the Bible or if you take uh, Shakespeare's works and you put your name on it, you're, that, that doesn't violate copyright law because it's public domain. You're, you're totally free to go onto Amazon and try to sell the Bible with your name on it. You're going to look like an idiot, but no one, you know, right now this is legal. Have you ever seen someone try to publish Shakespeare's works or Plato's works or the Bible under their own name? Does it ever happen? It's not even a real problem. Plagiarism is just a, a contractual issue between a student and his university, usually. It's a, it's a rule of conduct that says if you do research, you need to give attribution and don't pretend like it's, that you came up with it on your own. Don't have long quotations without quotation marks and a footnote. It has literally nothing to do with copyright infringement. You can have, uh, and in fact, plagiarism or lack of attribution is not the problem that most advocates of copyright have with copyright piracy. Like, it's not like Harry Potter, uh, it's not like uh, George Lucas, let's say, or, or Disney. Disney owns the Star Wars movies, right? It's not like Disney would say, look, as long, if you want to copy the Star Wars uh, Blu-ray for the latest Star Wars movie, as long as you keep my name on there and you don't pretend like you wrote it, it's okay with me. They don't want you to copy it at all, right? They don't want you to copy it verbatim. So the problem with copyright, from their point of view, is not plagiarism, it's not lack of attribution, it's not fraud, it's just copying their stuff without their permission. So the reason is supposedly because they're not going to get paid for it. Yeah, well, they th or they think, they think so. It's kind of like these, these guys that sell the knockoff handbags who claim a great loss, uh, or, or the, the originals claim a great loss, right. because somebody's Alan Harwin is selling these bags that look like theirs. Uh, for a fraction of what the real bags cost. And that's a trademark issue, by the way, but yes. But of course, uh, the people that are buying it would never buy them. Well, that's, that's a good, perfect example. So in the case where there's a, a knockoff Chanel bag, let's say, or a knockoff Rolex, and I buy it for $20 from a guy on, on the dock in Turkey or something, right? I know that it's a fake. I know I'm not getting a, a $3,000 Chanel purse for $20. I know that. So I'm the customer. I'm not being defrauded whatsoever. So you can't even say that there's fraud in that case. So you can see that the trademark enforcement has nothing to do with, with, with fraud. It's got to do with reputation rights. Chanel wants to be the only one that can – in fact, there's a, there's a trademark right called anti-dilution with tarnishment. They say that if you sell a shoddier version of mine, it's going to make mine look worse and hurt the value of mine. So you see they think there's property rights in value. They believe they have a property right in some kind of value, the goodwill with their customers, whatever. It's not a coherent proprietarian framework because property rights are always the right to control some physical resource. You can't have a property right in value. Value is just a subjective phenomenon. It's the way people analyze it. If the word Chanel is on that bag, yeah. it's still okay? Yeah, I have no, no problem with that whatsoever. There was something on the internet just today about the IKEA bag, uh, which you can buy it for 99 cents and carry your stuff around IKEA. And so big bag maker has, has now produced this beautiful $2,000 bag that looks almost like the IKEA bag. Right. That's, but that's competition. Yeah, that's a free market. So, oh, oh, yes. I, I mean, IKEA kind of loves it, of course. I would, too. But in this case, they, they've done a better job than IKEA did. And this is the problem with trademark and patent law is it prevents competition. It prevents better innovations from coming around because people are dissuaded. I mean, nowadays with copyright law and with patent law, the only pirates you're going to get are, are like shoddy type low-rent low people. They're not going to really come up with new improvements. They're just going to try to make a quick buck. But if it was totally legal, you'd have big competitors gearing up and doing something. They might do a better job. Yeah. The most absurd, absurd – uh, trademark thing I can think of is a few years ago, maybe you heard about this, somebody, the Girl Scouts who were re relatively unsuccessful selling one of their kinds of cookies, so somebody brought, bought, you know, 10,000 boxes of them or whatever and put them up on the internet and the Girl Scouts got him shut down for reselling cookies that were properly made, properly, you know, the GS on it and stuff and just because he was selling them and he wasn't a Girl Scout somehow they yeah, there's that was some kind of violation. There's some kind of uh, there's now. some kind of obscure trademark uh, right. I think it's called reverse palming off. That might be a case of that. It's bizarre. I mean, yeah. But you see, but that's this is not a case of protecting anyone from fraud. 
It's right. simply the Girl Scouts trying to use a legal, uh, basically a monopoly right that the government's done to, to reduce competition so they can sell at a higher price. It's always about that. I've got a question about YouTube. If you go to YouTube and look for movies, oftentimes you'll find movies which are reversed. Everything is written is actually written backwards. Yeah, I've seen that. What is that, what is all, all that about? Because, well, so YouTube, uh, YouTube faced liability under copyright law for all the videos that its users would put. This is in the beginning of YouTube, right? They faced liability under what's called vicarious infringement or contributory negligence. So they tried to take advantage of this thing in the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which was, I think, under Clinton in 1988, which says that it provided a safe harbor. As long as you have a takedown provision, then you won't be liable for the infringing acts of your users. So therefore, YouTube adopted this takedown system, which says that if they get a notice from someone claiming to have a copyright in a video, they will take it down right away without any, without any questions asked. And of course, the rights holders abuse that all the time even in cases where there's fair use though. So uh, YouTube adopted this system and they had so much, they have like a million, I think they have over a million automatic takedowns come in a day because these big media companies hire, they have robots, little, they crawl the web and they look for snippets of, of data, songs or images or movies that look the same as what their, what their algorithms say and they automatically send a, a, a takedown to YouTube. So some of these guys, they'll take their video and they'll flip it so that it doesn't match the algorithm of the robots. But of course the robots are going to adapt right. <laughs> before too long and then they'll have to go to something else. Maybe make it upside down and... I'm curious about the kind of law that you do. Are you basically defending people who are being sued? I, I, I'm primarily, I, I, help, uh, I help companies obtain patents. I'm a, I, I, it's called patent prosecution. I'm not really more on the litigation side right now, but I, I help companies obtain patents. But even, if even though you disagree with the idea, of well, I don't. I don't disagree that people, companies in today's system, they need to obtain patents for defensive purposes. Because if you don't have any patents, then if you get sued by a competitor for infringing their patents, then you you have no defense. Uh -huh. But if if you have your own arsenal of patents, then you can counter sue them, and then it, they might leave you alone. It's, it's a huge waste. So you have these companies developing these stockpiles of nuclear patents, right? <laughs> it's, like, it's like mutually assured destruction almost. It's a waste. If you got rid of the patent system, they wouldn't need to spend 50 or $100 million a year on patent attorney salaries and fees. They could just use that money for R&D. Right. Yeah. What do you think about the uh, idea of, uh, <clears throat> which bothers me a lot. I mean, the idea of a, a patent should be that somebody invents a weed eater or something, they can sell it and make the profit off of that. That makes a certain amount of sense to me. But suppose they decide, oh, we'd rather not sell the weed eater. We, we'd like our, we make more money on the lawnmowers, so we're just going to keep that patent on the weed eater. Nobody else can make them, and, and we'll sell our lawnmowers. So it's, it's not protecting them from from making a profit on something that they weren't going to sell anyway, that one really doesn't make any sense. I mean, I think once you once you grant a, a property right, once the government grants a property right, um, then you can't expect people not to use it. So a property right, get, you know, if you have a if you have a house, you have the right to have no one live in it, right? If you have a house, you have the right to uh, invite never invite anyone over to the house. It's the same idea. Or you have the right to lease it to someone or license it so like this pat whole patent troll idea or if like in, someone licenses their, their patent to a big company and they never make it, the, the guy that sells the patent. I mean, th it's a property right with a value. And if, if you believe the idea behind patents, which is that we need patents to incentivize people to create, then the patent right that you obtain is more valuable if you have the right to use it as you see fit. If you have the right to sell it to someone else or to even sit on it. Well, the other, the other side of the coin, and this is sort of an answer, as I would see the purest form of a copyright law or something would be that somebody, I consider them to have violated my copyright, and so I sue them, okay? So what do I sue them for? What do you have to sue for? You have to sue for damages, okay? Yeah, but they're, so sta they're, they're statutory they're damages. Okay, you weren't doing anything with it anyway. How were you damaged? You weren't going to sell it, so we sold it, you know? It's a, Except it's a, copyright law has statutory damages. So th there's a, th you can sue for actual damages, or statutory. Okay. Well, that's not so, in the Constitution. I mean, it, you know, so so this is part of what I'm saying for you there. I mean, why not 
why not go back to action? Why not get rid of the statutory well, the, damages instead of there, the, the whole thing? There is a there's a proposal by one of these law professors who's he's not as radical as I am. He wants to they want to radically reduce patent and copyright law. They don't want to get rid of it, but it's, I think it's called the founders copyright. So they want to go back to the way the system was at the beginning. Now, in the, of course, in the beginning of the country, copyright didn't apply to software <laughs> because there was no software. It didn't apply even to uh, I think it didn't even apply to paintings and things like that, it, 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 or even maps. It was only a narrow set of things it applied to, and the term was much shorter. There is a, there is a feature in some patent systems around the world. It's called a um, it's a, a, a working requirement. What that means is you have to if you don't actually make the product covered by the patent after a certain amount of time, it just evaporates. So that, that would be closer to what you're talking about. I proposed that before. I think that would be an improvement in the patent system, that you have to actually be making a product covered by your patent. Uh, it's the same thing in, in, like in Louisiana and oil and gas law. If you don't, uh, if you don't use your, your, uh, your oil and gas lease for more than 10, 15 years, then, then you're, is it 10? Yeah. So the, the, the lease or the user fruct just uh, yeah, it's, it's, expires. Yeah, it's 10 years, basically, or yeah, basically. 10 years non-use or right, something like or, that. Yeah, it reverts back to the land. Exactly, it reverts. It, right, to acquire the mineral rights, yeah. But so you could have something like that. In, now, what I would prefer would be, like in copyright law, the problem is in 82, I think, under the WIPO treaty, another way the treaties come into this, the, the old copyright system, you had to actively, you had to put a copyright notice on there, and you had to register it with the copyright office. Those are called formalities. Um, the good thing about that was if you didn't actively apply for a copyright, you just didn't have one. Or if you didn't renew it, you didn't have one, right? And then your name had to be on there with the copyright, so you could at least track down who the owner was if you wanted to get permission. Now, after, after the uh, – it was Berne Convention, not WIPO. Under the Berne Convention, um, copyright formalities were abolished. So right now, if you write a poem right now on a piece of paper, you own the copyright as soon as you do that. You don't have to file a notice. Uh, copyright registration, you don't have to put a copyright notice, you don't have to do anything. It's automatic. And this gives rise to the orphan works problem, right? Which is there's millions of works out there and no one knows how to find the owner because they might have died, you don't know who their kids are. So you have all these books and no one, everyone's afraid to republish them because they might get sued by someone coming out of the woodwork. So if you would get rid of the burn treaty and re-implement formalities and make people actively renew the copyright every 10 years, like you do for trademark, you have to renew it every so often. Yeah. That would do a lot of good to reducing the problem. It would kind of cut out the How, how old was clutter. the Berne Convention? I think it's Berne Convention. How, long, how old is it? I think it was, uh, I think U.S. joined in 80, do you want to say 82? Oh. Okay. On, on, on the thing you're bringing up, uh, uh, corporations, you know, someone will invent something corporations go, oh my God, that's going to lessen the value of my product. I'll buy that patent and bury it. You know, I've seen that happen. Uh, an e example then, I see it's too high, is the carburetor that gave uh, engines high mileage, and it was patented. And when it was introduced back in the 20s, the, the stock market saw this, and, and uh, the oil stocks dropped severely, and the oil companies realized that, this is a story, I don't know if it's true, this is one that I've read, that the uh, oil companies actually bought the uh, copyrights up, and you never heard of that carburetor before. <laughs> yeah, I've heard, I don't know if that story is apocryphal or true, I, I'm, I'm suspicious of it because the one thing about patents is they're public, so you can buy it up, but all, to, pro to prove this conspiracy, all anyone has to do is go down to the patent office and uh, find that patent there and were, produce there were people it. People that actually produced the uh, patents, and again, I don't know if they were real. Well, yeah, I've never seen. I've, so, like I say, it, <laughs> but yeah, it's pot. It, that's that's legal, but I've yeah. I know of a situation personally where Microsoft was involved. What happened was I was selling real world software. Real world software was having a difficulty. They got purchased by Great Plains. Then Microsoft purchased Great Plains to bury all of it. They never produced the software. I believe that. Yeah. But there's people out there who are also thinking about the same kind of technical problem, and they come up with their own solution. Yeah. You know, one idea doesn't necessarily get suppressed forever. Well, no, it's not the idea suppressed. It's just it's just taking the competition 
and bury it. And it's so eliminate competition. That's what it's all about. Yeah. It's competition. So I, I yeah. think we're basically out of questions, and you're giving us an awful lot of your time. Yeah. Oh. Glad to do it. Well, thank you. Very thank much. you. Thank you.